Uh, for those of you who are new to the story of race or those of you who know the old story of race, it's a good idea to start again afresh. So many people I've spoken to over the years have known the old race and we now currently have what I would consider the new race. It basically almost everything about the company has changed in the last couple of years and including the share price. Uh, next slide, please. This gives you an overview of the company. Uh, we have approximately 143 million shares on issue, 25, a little under 26 million options. Of those, 7 million uh, bonus options we issued to the shareholders on a one for 20 basis uh, around a month ago. Share price, uh, as of yesterday, um, close was at 389. When I spoke uh, last year around December, it was around $2. We've had a, quite an amazing run in the share price over that time. Uh, the current market cap is around $560 million. We have about $12 million in the bank. And we have a number of significant shareholders, not least myself. Um, I own a little under 10% um, and on a fully diluted basis, a little over 10%. Next slide, please. Before I talk to you about FTO and Basantrin, I'd like to give you a brief overview of cancer. Uh, one of the things that many people don't realize is there's a long gap between when the cancer was initiated um, and when you end up actually having a mass large enough to be detected or cause problems. Uh, that process is slow, complex, involves many different changes. But the really key point in the whole process of cancer is at the point of metastasy, which is when it can spread. And that's the point when the cancer generally acquire treatment resistance. This is a major problem. Obviously, if you have a cancer and it can be treated, uh, you don't have a problem. If you have a cancer that's small enough to be cut out on its own, you have a benign tumor. If you have something that's once it's spread around the body uh, and it's resistant to all treatment, uh, that's when you have a major, major problem. Next slide, please. And one of the key proteins, or key genes involved in driving this process, particularly the step from a, a treatable tumour to an uncontrolled metastatic uh, tumour that's resistant to all treatment options, is overexpression of a protein called FTO, which stands for fat mass and obesity associated protein, or originally it stood for a gene called FATSO. It's a particular protein that lies in a critical pathway of regulation that controls which proteins a cell will produce. And from the perspective of cancer, it, the expression of FTO drives cancer development, treatment resistance and metastases. Uh, that's, and like there are many proteins that are involved in this, what makes FTO particularly interesting is that it's involved in a huge range of different cancers. And basically all the major cancers and most of the minor cancers, a subset of those cancers, a significant subset, are being driven by FTO overexpression. The interesting thing about all of this from a scientific perspective is this was something that was only discovered in the last couple of years. Uh, and this is one of the consequences of this is it's one of the hottest areas of cancer research currently going on. There's a huge amount of publications coming out on a daily basis around this whole process. I won't go into the details of how FTO works and how it fits into the whole pathway system. Just from the perspective of an investor, all you need to understand is it sits there key right in the middle of the process of um, cancer becoming a, a far more dangerous uh, cancer. Next slide, please. This here just gives you a brief overview. Um, on the left is an overview of all the major cancers of the body. Uh, and on the right there is all those cancers that are then involved that have FTO overexpression driving that particular, uh, those particular cancers. So basically all the cancers that are commonly found have a subset that is being driven by this. 
Uh, next slide, please. On top of this, it's been discovered that if you can inhibit FTO, in other words, switch it off, you can actually um, generate overcome resistance to or enhance the activity of other treatment options, including the checkpoint inhibitors, uh, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, other cancer chemotherapeutic agents like alkylating agents um, uh, and um, other DNA damaging agents, PARP inhibitors, hypermethylating agents, even something as different as radiotherapy. Uh, the resistance to that can be driven through FTI overexpression. So you can imagine that this is a very exciting target to go after. If you can inhibit FTO, then you can actually make, not only can you attack the cancers directly, you can overcome the resistance to the, that cancers are developed to these other treatment options. Next slide, please. So this brings us to the next slide, which is the drug, the Santrine. And this is a drug that's been around for a long time, and many of you are aware of this as being a chemotherapeutic agent. But in practice, it's actually not really a chemotherapeutic agent. It's a very ineffective uh, chemotherapeutic drug. You have to give almost heroic doses of the drug to get an effect. But what it has turned out to be is an extremely potent FTO inhibitor. Um, and We've seen this historically in a large number of clinical trials. It has worked exceptionally well in a lot of different cancer types, both leukemias and solid tumors, such as breast and ovarian. And we recently saw in a small phase two trial we ran in Israel, uh, a 40% response rate in a very difficult to treat patient population. So we've, since we've re sort of discovered this drug, we've remanufactured it, we've rebuilt the patent position around that and we have orphan drug designation for AML. Next slide, please. So FTO inhibitors, what are there out there? There is, because it's such a new area and people have only just discovered the importance of FTO literally in the last two years, uh, there are very few known FTO inhibitors that are out there and none that are really um, suitable to be used in the laboratory. The number one most potent uh, drug that's been discovered has been Bisantrine. This has gone all the way through uh, the clinical development process in the past, so we know a large amount how it behaves in humans, uh, and it's extremely potent. Uh, and if you compare it to some of the other drugs that are out there that have just been discovered, uh, it, it's not only is it um, very effective at very low concentrations, uh, we also have a huge advantage in being very advanced in the clinical development process. So as I mentioned before, we've manufactured it, we've used it in a phase two. Uh, we're about to launch into a whole series of new phase two trials uh, to take this through um, in this particular indication. So a really exciting opportunity. Next slide, please. The team, obviously, uh, we have a great team at RACE. I won't go into detail because I haven't got the time. Uh, to go into this, but next slide, please. But rest assured, we know what we're doing. So we've taken this data, which was only discovered about 12 months ago, almost to the week, uh, about FTO and Bisantrine, and built a new strategy around targeting FTO in a couple of lead indications, melanoma and a kidney cancer called clear cell renal carcinoma. We have a whole series of programs in the laboratory, preclinical, and we have a series of clinical programs being in developed around those indications. We also have historical data around breast cancer. It's very effective. It went through a phase three trial and a lead sort of indication for approval is in AML, where we have two phase two trials currently underway in that indication. Next slide, please. So we've announced a large number of activities over um, the last six months. So we have positive breast cancer and ovarian cancer preclinical results. We've now got four new programs underway at the University of Newcastle in collaboration with them. We've appointed the discoverer of uh, FTO role in this pathway, Professor Chen from the City of Hope to our scientific advisory board. And in the last couple of weeks, we've initiated an AML phase two trial in a particular subtype of AML called extramedullary that will be run here in Australia. 
uh, and we also have initiated the process of another phase two trial in, a, uh, in Israel, a larger one than the last one we ran. Next slide, please. Give you an idea of the activities that are underway or are about to get underway. It lays out the sort of activity timeline. We have a lot of activity, a lot of data being generated. Because all these trials are open label, which means they're not double blinded, we don't have to wait for the end of the trial before we uh, uh, can report on how they're progressing. We know as they're going along. Uh, so there's a lot of news flow to be expected over the um, coming year, year and a half. Uh, next slide. Just before I end, I'd like to just sort of sum up. We've got a really amazing strategy and opportunity that just fell into our laps. Um, it's sort of the mining equivalent of tripping over the welcome stranger. We have a really nice balanced risk and reward opportunity there. We've got an amazing team committed to the shareholders. And we have a management team that has serious skin in the game. All of us have bought our shares. Uh, we really are focused entirely on achieving an outcome via either sale or licensing to a large pharma partner to take this through all the way. Thank you. Thanks, Daniel. A um, couple of questions here. Um, why, why was Bicentrin ineffective as a cancer drug in its previous life? Uh, it actually was. It was actually quite effective. The reason why it got lost was that the, the original company that owned it called Ledley Laboratories uh, ran a large phase three trial in breast cancer. And unfortunately, they under they messed up the dosing of that trial. So the first half of the trial was done with one dose and then they realized they were using a too low a dose and they then up that dose, uh, which made it ineligible for approval. You can't change things halfway through a phase three trial. At that point, they didn't have enough time left to re-go and rerun a new um, phase three trial in breast cancer. And so they ended up dropping it. And so it's really sad. It made it all the way to the market in France, uh, but they decided it wasn't um, worthwhile continuing with uh, just for that small indication. So yeah, a lot's changed in the cancer market in that time. So it was just bad luck really. And um, just a, a question here from Chris. I understand we're approaching big pharma in a strategic manner with trials to continue next year. Will, that, will those conversations likely continue as a trial unfolds in 2022? Exactly. So as because they're open label, we know they're, how they're going. So we're able to have meaningful conversations with pharma about the drug. So while we've got a lot of data to support um, from a preclinical perspective to go back in, it's using the drug in a, a new way. Um, and so we need to make sure we've got that clinical data and it changes the whole conversation you have. You know, if you've got an exciting drug that works in mice, that's great. But if you've got an exciting drug that works in humans, that's fantastic. And uh, you spoke briefly about the board and we realised there's not a lot of time, but you recently had a, a new uh, appointment in Dr. David Fuller. Can you tell us a little bit about his background and yeah, how he's, he the company? Yeah, he's our new CMO. He's extremely experienced um, in running clinical trials, um, designing clinical trials. He was um, at Cineos, which is a CRO, just till recently, so he's, I think he's been 30 years or so in that space. So very, very experienced guy. He starts next Monday, actually. So looking forward to it. He's so excited. He's been working with us already uh, along the way. He can't, can't stop. Unfortunately, it's one of these things, once you get started, you start to learn about the opportunity. It's really hard not to get excited about it. And in terms of excitement, what are kind of the catalysts um, and the news uh, shareholders or new shareholders could expect moving forward? Uh, I think the first ones will be first patient being treated, probably most likely in Israel will be first up just purely because of the timeline. But I think the initiation of the phase one, two for FTO, the FTO solid tumor trial will be something that'll be towards the end of the year, will be something that'll be really exciting. Any positive signal in those indications will really drive, I think, a lot of interest, uh, both by shareholders and outside um, large pharma and so forth. 